Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Happy Hour with Founder. This is a series of interviews with some of the amazing startup founders we've come to know where we explore advice and stories from their hard work um, required to build their, their, their startups. My name is Jody Page, and I'm joined today by Ajit Viswanathan uh, from Doctable. Hi, Ajit. How are you today? Good, good job pronouncing your last name, uh, Jody. I know you, 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 you practiced that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it, took, it took me a couple of passes to be told for the people out there, but uh, I appreciate your patience. Anyways, uh, how are you, sir? Doing well, doing well. You know, thanks, thanks for the opportunity. And, you know, happy yeah, time. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, I, and I always like to uh, open this up acknowledging that this is a happy hour event, and I, I've I got a little maker's mark here with me so uh what what, what did you bring with you uh, my silver ballast point we, we are in san diego so uh, a local of course we are yes. Off to the yes. Right ballast point. yes absolutely well, well cheers to you and thank you so much for uh for, for joining us today cheers so g maybe just as a starting point i mean you and i've been working together i i, I took a look at it since uh, uh november 2018 is when we first started working together but for the people out there maybe just give a quick minute on on kind of you know, what, what Doctable does and, and maybe even a little bit of your background, that sort of thing. So I'll just go ahead and let you start there. Sure. Well, I mean, Doctable is a patient retention and communication platform. And it, the goal of it is to help healthcare providers be more efficient and profitable using technology. Uh, you know, the, the paradigm of healthcare, especially nowadays with, with COVID, has changed significantly where you know, practices are reliant more on easier tools to stay in touch with their patients. So you see the shift happening where phone calls is kind of like being a thing of the past and patients prefer it, of course, because it's easier, but practices are doing it because it helps them uh, get in touch faster. And so it yep. helps them better access to care. And so that's kind of like what we do. And we work with thousands of practices across the nation. Uh, and, and there's a lot more things, of course, that we do to kind of help the practices, but that's kind of primarily uh, the core of what we do is to really help them, you know, from a smaller practice perspective, because we know that the big health systems have the large budgets to invest in technology. But what about the, you know, those practices that you see as you're driving down in different, in your, you know, by your neighborhood, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they may not have all the budget to be able to invest in, in, in a large technology stack. And that's where we come in is we keep it very affordable and really Got help it. them get their Got it. Makes sense. And, and um, I, you know, being in, in kind of the med, the med tech space, if you will, um, you know, we've seen some other businesses in, in that space uh, as of late, see a little bit of a bump as a function of what's going on. Um, how, how, how have you seen a benefit? I mean, I'm sure there's been headwinds you've faced as well, because it's not all gravy, right? But have you seen some increase in, in your top of funnel and leading indicators that the COVID is kind of working in your favor in that regard? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, I mean, obviously we, you know, we wish a world where, you know, COVID was not there and, you know, obviously yeah. the damage that's caused to many folks, you know, can't yeah. even quantify that. But with Doctable, I mean, we were not immune, uh, you know, in, in late March when I think in the pandemic became a much bigger mm -hmm. issue yeah. here. Uh, I mean, we were, uh, on red alert ourselves too, right? sure. because many mm -hmm. practices were told to close down, yep. many deemed non-essential, and so there's a yeah. typical uncertainty across the board. But once the first couple of months went by, so April and yep. May were a little bit uncertain even for us, but then what we realized yep. is that, as you were mentioning, Jody, that June onwards, uh, technology needed to be adopted. I mean, they had yep. to, for example, not have patients wait inside the waiting room anymore because they didn't want yep. them to be exposed to the virus. Yep. And so we've definitely seen like a communication platform had huge uptakes. I mean, from uh, uh, just a messaging volume perspective, there's a 300% growth in how many messages now we send for our customer, for our customers who send to their patients. And so it has opened up new doors, right? I mean, obviously yep. we prefer to not you know, be in this situation, but <laughs> right, of course. sometimes. Right. You know, it does present an opportunity. And so we have seen some of our other product lines that were a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, not as high growth before have pretty mm -hmm. much burped at this point. So we yeah. now are in a state where, you know, there are primary products with our top line funnels and what our sales teams are selling. So right. I think right. we see some good, good growth happening from those products at this point. Good, good. And then I, I, you know, I think it would also be interesting to hear from you about, you know, being a business that's, it, it, 
it doesn't sound right saying it, but to more or less is benefiting from the current circumstances to one degree or another. There's also the other side of it, right? right? You're, you're seeing headwinds just like everybody else. So even with that bump, what's, what's, you know, what's giving you a stomach ache and keeping you up at night right now um, in terms of what you're having to deal with with the business? Yeah, I think, look, I, I definitely do worry about the macro environment around us. Mm-hmm. Right? Like I, I, mm-hmm. I think we, we're very, I, I always say to our own employees, and, you know, I'm thankful that I have a job, right? I mean, I was there yeah. 10 years ago when, when, when the recession happened and, you know, I was on HR. You know, yeah. when I lost my job at that point and, and it can be yeah. extremely, humbling. you know, absolutely. And, you know, yeah. you had a very limited time frame to find a job. And so, I, I realized that, you know, having been through this in a previous cycle that I'm very thankful that I get to be still, you know, have a job and work with customers. But I think mm-hmm. the typical headwinds we run against is, you know, you know, how does this shape out, you know, the spending levels across the board, you know, yeah. do people tighten up their purses, right? We, mm-hmm. we, we can't predict those things. Uh, right. I always say that, look, I'm thankful that our technology is a core operational part of many of these practices. So right. they kind of need this to function. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, you know, small businesses, I mean, that's the lifeblood of American economy. I mean, they're, they're struggling. And, you know, many of our practices are small businesses, right? I mean, yep. their costs are uh, rising. And if they don't see enough patients who are fearful to go visit a doctor because of the pandemic and the virus, well, it does mm-hmm. impact our customers too. So I think that's, that's kind of like what we watch out for. But other than that, we're very thankful that, you know, we get to be in an industry where, you know, it is still after the initial headwinds, for the most part, it has recovered too. That's good, obviously. Um, and and I'm, I assume you were able to take advantage of stimulus like PPP or, or and or EIDL. Um, I know you you and I, to your point, you know, in late March. I mean, you know, we we had a quick check in. Um, just just I think you were just trying to get a sense of kind of what levers were available and that sort of thing. And and um, you know, obviously, it it, it worked out to your benefit. Um, I guess th- in in terms of that that you know PPP money and and you know I mean listen I mean it's inexpensive money at worst it's free money at best right if you if you execute on on what you need to in order to take advantage of that um, what when you got that money in you know because you guys were doing you guys were doing well before this happened right so you get this injection in you don't see necessarily the fall off that you were anticipating um, or, or you know hoping against. So now you got this new cash to the balance sheet, like, oh, well, now we got a little bit extra to one with. So, like, how do you prioritize where you're going to allocate those funds? You know, because it's really kind of a, just a, a, something that showed up, right? Yeah, I mean, look, first of all, we're very we're, we're thankful for that too. And, and part of it is like we we're talking about back in March and April, there's a lot of uncertainty even mm-hmm. for us. And, you know, I was very transparent with the team and I said that look, we don't know how this thing shapes up. This thing continues for a long time. I mean, it, it would definitely hurt. Back mm-hmm. too. We're not immune to what's going on around us. And so the PPP, the intent was great. And I think we, we worked with you know our bank, which is Silicon Valley Bank. And mm-hmm. what it did is give us the first, uh, you, you know, the, the kind of like making sure that the books are in order and we didn't have to do anything, any drastic changes with our current employee structure. And so I think that was what payroll protection program, I mean, we protected every job we, we could. And once we knew that we were back on like where things are not shutting down, uh, right. we want to do our part and, you know, do what we can on the hiring front, right? So we, right. we said, let's, let's go out there and, nice. hire, uh, and continue the, the period of growth that we had pre-pandemic. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for example, we've had about eight new people join the team since, mm-hmm. you know, in, in the last 60 days. Right. And we have about another seven to eight requisitions open. And, you know, whatever we can do in our own small way to say that, look, let's not just keep it and park it and just. Right. Like, of right. course, you're putting, it, you're putting it to work. You feel a social responsibility to put that money to work, even though. And you I know, like, to. we can't make a big dent, but if every company in our own way can mm-hmm. do like that and so that's why we're you know we we're able to hire like 15 20 employees in the last 90 days of, of oh that's amazing that's and amazing that, that's really man helpful. cheers to you for that you know what to be true truth be told i i would drink for any reason but <laughs> cheers. <laughs> <laughs> cheers to you for that man honestly um and you've you've listen you've you've 
once again, we started working together in, in November 18. Um, and here we are fast forward, you know, call it 18 months later, you know, give or take. And um, a little more than that, actually. And you've, you've grown two times. You've two X um, just in that period. Um, what, like, that's, you're scaling quickly, right? What, what, <laughs> how are you dealing with that? Like, you know, aside from COVID and, and um, what is, Tell me a little bit about that process, kind of where, where you really got hung up, if you will. Like, where did you get hung up most in that window? That's, a, that's the question, right? Yeah, and, and you know, I, I think to set the stage, I mean, like, we, we, we took a little bit of a different approach. Even though we've raised venture capital to, to date, mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. you know, we have said that, look, you know, there's this, this school of thought about, you know, investing in growth and raising large rounds. And right. we went to the excess and Jody, when you and I met, of course, we're like, do we mm -hmm. go down the venture debt route? Yeah. Or do we go down the you know the uh, you know venture round? Mm -hmm. And we felt that look, if we can we can get the unit economics to be a function of our growth, where you know if we are able to bring a dollar in and we're not burning three dollars to get our growth, that right, was right. our kind of like philosophy that we had adopted in uh, after we raised the round in 2017. <laughs> the reason why that's important is that means that every decision we took right from when we met and you know the last two years that you were mentioning Jody was mm -hmm. we had to find ways to pay for any growth through our own growth itself more mm -hmm. organically so the challenge with that is we don't have uh, funds to pay for many of these uh, you know sources of growth and let me give you an example so uh, when we were starting out in November 2018 you know we had an inside sales team which you know, primarily calls yeah. our practices and sells to them but we had no, for example, trade show team because there's, you know, there's, there's definitely a way to sell during trade shows. Um, we did not have any function of marketing, right? Because we just didn't have the capacity to be able to spend on marketing. So when you look from that lens and that, that perspective, um, it, was, it was hard because you, know, you obviously are looking at other competition that is selling where you, know, you see their marketing ads out there and we were still like, you know, we didn't have much of a branding out there, but that's a function because we didn't have the, 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 the revenue and the, the bank balance to be able to support that. But we felt that if we are able to get next month this much more in net new MRR, the following quarter this much more, then we let that fund some of these sources. So when you look at, you know, what were the stomach aches? I mean, it was, you know, always so close to red line in terms of like how much we could spend because we didn't have a big cushion to fall back upon, right? So we couldn't say, hey, next month, let's do a special and you know, spend $100,000 mm -hmm. on marketing. So it had to be very organic growth. And so with that comes its own challenges, right? I mean, right, we could not right. exceed the size of the team to a certain extent because we had to wait till our revenue caught up. And so once that caught up, then we were making these investments. So it was a very much you know, threading the needle in certain situations about how we let revenue catch up then we start making those investments. So now, for example, to, to give you an example, now uh, we have marketing, we have a you know, biz dev team, we have a trade show team, we have inside sales team, we have an upsell team. So we have diversified our revenue sources to say that we're not depending on one source of revenue channels, we have multiple mm -hmm. channels. But it didn't happen overnight. Now, if we had raised more cash, we probably would have done a lot of these initiatives probably back in 2018 itself. Right, but right. we felt that we want to be financially prudent and disciplined about our growth. Right, right. And and when I when we work with people, um, you know, and that, that kind of equity versus debt conversation comes up, right? And and they both they both serve their purposes. I, I'm always quick to illustrate that. Um, but it's kind of a managed growth scenario, which to me is kind of what you're describing versus kind of a more you know, we're going to swing for the fences now kind of thing, which, which frankly, I think is better suited for, for equity. Correct. Um, so kind of, kind of shifting because you did go out and raise equity or right? you did successfully raise VC, which, you know, obviously is, is a nice feather in the cap um, because I believe your first time, this is kind of your first time entrepreneur, uh, if I'm not, if I'm yep. not mistaken. Um, and I definitely want to talk about that and taking that leap. So I, I, I definitely got that earmark to some to touch on, but um, like, I, I am curious to know as somebody that did successfully raise VC and you know that well's available because you have something that's attractive, particularly in light of what's going on right now, 
you know, how, you know, <laughs> how do you, like, how do you just say, mm, no, you know what? No, like I, I'm, I'm good with how we're growing right now. Like what, what would make you go back to that? Well, that's, that's a good question right there. No, and look, it's, it's, it's a multi-million dollar question because, you know, what is the right answer? It just, we have a version of our answer, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, I, I will say that, look, especially when you're building a SaaS company, you do need to have an investment because for the subscription revenue to catch up, um, you do need to pay for sales and product. And so by no means it like, and I, I you know, I, I, I raised, you know, I salute the folks who were able to build SaaS companies bootstrap without taking any capital. I mean, that's such a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had raised about four and a half million dollars prior to tapping into the debt markets. And one of the reasons why we felt that, you know, we didn't want to go back to venture just yet. Right. I mean, it's not a never say never, of course, for the right, right. investors will, will be open, but you know, we needed the capital to get to the stage, but you know, we always felt that, you know, the growth at all costs sometimes, uh, you know, kind of it, it puts a mirage on your true CAC, your acquisition costs and your, you know, your payback period. And we didn't want to build an organization where we were so dependent on venture growth capital, right. where we, we felt that, look, if something happened, if there was a recession in the economy, we can't then at that point be able to sustain because we don't have the, like we'll always have to be raising money. I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. We just felt that, we always wanted to be ready. Should there be an end part of it? It's probably because we got burned. I think personally being burned 10 years back where I was at a startup and you know, it did uh, have to close down due to the recession. So yeah. I think some scar tissue from that, from those days. So we felt that <laughs> right. we wanted to be ready if we were ever encountered. And you know what? We did get encountered this, this year with that piece. And so we felt that our way to grow was unit economics. We wanted to be uh, growing in a way where once we raised the initial venture around, it's, it's not growth at all costs, it's grow correctly and grow with the right unit economics so that we can be uh, a, you know, a reasonably profitable com you know, company, which is not a word that gets used a lot you know, right. in, when you, you talk to venture companies, right? right. And, right. and we're in that hybrid because we have raised venture, but we have got a very supportive board and very yep. supportive investors who say that, look, we get it. We understand why maybe you're not gonna grow for 150% this year, mm -hmm. but if you're growing, where you're not burning too much cash, then why not pursue that route? And that's, right. that's the route that we chose as a management team, as a, right. as a board of directors. We had that discussion. And look, the, there's many of our competitors right now, even today, raising 15, $20 million rounds, just as mm -hmm. just two weeks back. Mm -hmm. um, and look, good for them. I, I know many of them, right? And so I, mm -hmm. I just think that it's the, whatever approach they felt that was right for their business. And we, you know, it's not luck for lack of us our, in our inability to tap into the venture market, I do think that, you know, thankfully our metrics are allowing us to probably talk about a series B, but mm -hmm. we just felt that, you know what, it's not the right time this year. Uh, we'll see how we feel next year. Uh, Q3 of next year, we'll see that is it the right, right time. Uh, and and what or I, we're facing some headwinds, or we have some strategic initiative that requires capital, then yeah, we'll go out and raise. Right. That's kind but, of I mean, what a what a luxury for you to have. I mean, you know, I'm sure it's one that a lot of people would, and, and I don't know how, but somehow <laughs> VC always knows when you don't need them, and that's when they want to. <laughs> that's when they want to gauge with you the most. I certainly, I mean, I think I've had a few reach out to you via me, yes. um, at least one or two. Um, so it's nice to know that you're, you're wanted, so to speak. Uh, well, I remember the days when I was on the other side of the fence. So. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, but I, I got to, you know, having, having worked through some deals and, and actually some tense moments, actually, if you really think about when you and I, I mean, when we did our initial deal and even, even the follow on, um, you know, there were some tense moments in the negotiation. Yeah. Um, you know, but the one thing I have to say about that is I, I, I think, I think a healthy negotiation is going to be a little bit contentious, right, at, at points, because, I mean, the stakes are high. Both parties, you know, have things they have to account for relative to their mandates, right? And, and then, you know, ultimately, you want to preserve as much of your business as you can for the business and ultimately for the stakeholders. So, you know, you have to dig your heels in. Um, do you approach... I mean, you've been through the VC thing. You and I have been through it a couple times and, and we got through it. We got the deal done. I don't think either party was like entirely happy with everything, but I think we were happy enough with what we were getting that we moved it forward. So 
I, I certainly have my philosophies, if you will, about how I approach negotiations, but I am curious to hear from you having done both and us having had that back and forth. Is there a particular philosophy you bring to your negotiations? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember you commenting that your analyst was in our negotiations that commented to you saying, hey, that was a little bit tense, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, here, yeah. Here we are, we're s- sipping away on, uh, you know. Exactly, right? exactly. Uh, you can't I, make I, it through. Yeah, I, I think my philosophy is it's got to be win-win. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. like I, I don't perceive uh, negotiations as a zero-sum game. I don't think one yep. has to lose for the other to win. Um, yep. It all comes down to what is important. Um, you know, I have a certain, when I walk into any negotiation, I know, especially even on the venture side, this, you know, the documents are so huge and yeah. I don't want to get caught up on things that are not important or that important to me. I'm going to have mm-hmm. three or four things that, uh, that are non-budgeable for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and it's like the button. I mean, I, I will walk away if those things were not to my favor, but then I also have to walk into any negotiation where there's a sense that I, I am giving some head leeway to the other party too, because it cannot always yep. be just everything that I wanted. So, yep. you know, you just, it, it's, it's got to come with a lot of preparation to saying, what is important to you? Are we, are we debating and arguing over terms that really don't even matter? And right. we got to right. let the emotion run out of it because I think you know, we're human beings negotiating. I think yep. egos and it's very hard because, you know, sometimes that's, that usurps the conversation. But I, I do think that, coming in in a very clinical approach of being able to say, hey, look, here's what we're going to agree on. Here's what you're not. And walk away with, I mean, you and I have had lunches and we, we met mm-hmm. afterwards. I, I have much and deep respect for you and how you approach it. And there's nothing yeah. personal. We're yeah. just being, trying to do the best for each other. <laughs> I think that's the important thing. And that's what I really appreciated about our ability to sit down after what was, you know, I said some contentious moments that, were my commented on and, and then we sat out and, and we broke bread and I think we both knew it was like yeah, this is not personal we just we just had to work through it and and I think it's important to be able I think just in a relationship broadly it's an important thing but particularly professionally in a growth environment where the stakes are high once again you know not every decision that gets made is going to be right and you know and you have to be willing to course correct to really keep the thing moving in the right direction. And there's gonna be some contentious moments that come up internally and externally. So knowing that you can basically be on the opposite sides of an issue, find some common ground, work through that, and then move forward without re- like any sort of carried resentment um, is I, I think hugely important. And truth be told, I think it's a hard thing for a lot of people to do. I mean, earlier in my career, I certainly, was guilty of that and um but once again it's just something i really appreciate about and, and uh, definitely our... like even on the venture side right i mean like it's, i mean these are your partners because you know your venture mm-hmm. is probably going to sit on your board of directors so yep you no know, we yep. cannot afford to start a relationship uh on on a bad foot i think like we, we have to be able to look at them as allies and that's what you know i'm very fortunate in our board you know like when i when we have issues we we are able to express to them and uh, you know so that they're aware of it because their job is to help me as a CEO and, you know, uh, remove some obstacles that maybe I can remove it. So if we don't have the relationship and we're caught up on, hey, you negotiated X, Y, Z, you, you know, it's right. not, that relationship's not going to thrive as you go through yep. other, you know, yeah. tough times that's going to be coming up. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think honestly, you know, when you go through something like that and come out on the other side, it's, it's, it's a strengthened relationship. Right. Because there, there is a trust factor. I think there was a trust factor that existed between us in tranche two that did not entrust in, in, in one. Even though you were introduced to us through, um, I think, Tech Coast Angels, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I believe. I believe so. Yeah. 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 And so there was there was a kind of a common connection, but we still had to kind of work through that. I, mean, I think um, you the nail on the head, Jody. I mean, like, I think if you read the book of the five dysfunctions of a team, the, the very first one they talk about. And teams are dysfunctional because of a lack of conflict, right? They say conflict is good, done correctly, because yep. it builds trust. Uh, yep. And that's yep. great read, by the way. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to I want to um, thank you for that, by the way. I, I want to I want to rewind a little bit about six years or so. You're uh, you're you're working. You're 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 working for the man, so to speak, um, doing your thing. Um, and something 
something inspired you to take a take a leap of faith on Doctable. And I don't believe you necessarily had like specific med tech background, if I'm not mistaken. So I wasn't what, the health what was, yeah, right. So. What what but what was the genesis and what made you think, you know what, it's time, I'm doing this, right? What what was yeah. it? <laughs> Uh, I'm rolling back the, outside of insanity, right? <laughs> rolling back, back the clock on this one. Uh, I, I look. I, I always was curious about entrepreneurship. You know, mm-hmm. you know, from ever since I entered the professional life, but I, I didn't know how to start. Right? I mean, you know, right. someone who's I didn't grow up here, so I didn't know like all the rules. So mm-hmm. and I wouldn't even. I, I made a very brief attempt, you know, like like 13 years back, and it was a dud within like. 30 days because I didn't put my right. mind into it, right? So, mm-hmm. and then I went, you know, into the, cor- you know, I went to the startup world then you know, I, I went from MBA thinking like, look, now I'm going to mm-hmm. go up, you know, down the corporate ladder. So uh, a big part of like me, you know, doing the MBA was saying, hey, I'm now going to go as a corporate executive route. Yep. Yep. Um, but then, you know, I, and I was in the healthcare space, at that time. So I, this yeah. was like probably 2013. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the Affordable Care Act had been passed 2010. So you're starting to see some remnants of that starting to play into effect in 2013. Mm-hmm. And so I yeah. had this idea and, you know, it's just one of those things. And like, because I did my MBA, my brain was a little bit more freed up because I didn't have that part being occupied with, you know, all the stuff that comes with an MBA. Right. Right? So right. just that I had this portion of the brain that got opened up where like, hey, you can try to experiment. Some bandwidth. Things. <laughs> yeah, something right. open up, and you know, I always enjoyed work, and I always took pride in my work. And you know, sure. whether I was an entrepreneur or not, I always you know enjoyed you know working hours and just staying engaged with work. And so I was like, you know, yep. what if I could do the same thing for something that I really felt passionate about? Mm-hmm. And so that was the genesis where you know I saw that the landscape of healthcare was changing, and mm-hmm. you know, I had this idea, and the thing was that it kept gnawing at me again and again. And I was like, what if I don't want to regret not actually attempting to doing this, this thing. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So that's kind of like what I said, like, if like, but I, like, I was just me. I was like, you know, I literally Google, how do you start a company? Right. Like, and like, what is the process and all look like? And, you know, it's, it's startups are always so much about hard work and all that stuff that you hear, but it's also so much luck too, because, you know, I had to run into a co-founder. I was like, who's going to be my, I don't know technical stuff. I, I, so, you know, right. I worked with my co-founder Liam for at a previous startup, and you know, many mm-hmm. years back. And so, he was at the right stage on his life, saying, "Yeah, I'd like to pursue it." And apparently, that idea is actually the worst idea because we abandoned that three months later. But you know what? We stumbled into so, like I'm sure you'll talk right. about. It. We had to pivot two times before we get to this one. But right. you know, that's kind of like what the genesis was. I mean, I, I realized that I was at the stage of my life where. I didn't want to get climb up the corporate ladder and then the opportunity yeah. cost the switch becomes too high. And yeah. so you just have to dive yeah. into the pool. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. You know, there are a couple of things you said in there um, that, that uh, I want to get to. And I think one is just kind of the, the cultural adjustments of being somebody that did not grow up here and, and, and frankly trying to try to navigate you know, this, this tech ecosystem, um, finance as well for me, you know, as a, as a person of color. Right. And, and, um, and just, you know, the, I, I think the adjustments that you have to make culturally that I, I think not everybody really fully appreciates if, you know, I mean, they wouldn't, they wouldn't know, right. They're, it's just not their, their existence. Um, I, I am curious to hear from you. Um, and this is kind of pre, pre, uh, doctable, truth be told, like, what was that experience like for you? I think that's relevant right now. Like, what was that experience like for you operating as a person of culture in corporate America? And did that experience nudge you in the direction of wanting to be your own man, person, right? Like, yeah. can you can you speak to that? Yeah, and you look, I, I always look at, when I look back, you know, obviously that there's always, and many people, you know, people of color, especially like you, you, you run into situations that are not ideal and, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I had my, my share too, but mm-hmm. I, I try to look back on, you know, but still, you know, there are so many people who are my mentors or who oh, are yeah. absolutely kind of like help me and guide me. I mean, I can, mm-hmm. I can cite like 
uh, strangers who, I mean, you know, when, yeah. when, I, when the chips were down and I was, like I mentioned, you know, I was laid yeah. off and, yep. you know, I had, you know, four weeks to find a job because I was on an H1B and it literally was a stranger who helped me get, yep. get, get a job. And so I try to look for that kind of like the positive stories about, you know, yep. yes, yep. there, there were cases where they were not ideal, but how many people, yep. you know, stepped up. And so, in the corporate life, same thing. I mean, we, I had a lot of people who were gunning for my success. And so when I said to them, like I actually told my bosses that I'm going to start doing Docable. And they actually said, dude, you should. You, like, like they didn't, like I, I was looking for that validation that maybe I'm mm -hmm. not sure. Mm -hmm. They were the ones who said, no, you should do it. I mean, you, it looks, sounds great. And so, you know, what I would, I would comment on that is that, look, Part of it is, is I was frustrated that I was not growing faster, right? I mean, yeah. in, in a corporate yeah. role and I yeah. felt that, you know, I, I could not be the maker of my own destiny. I mean, I, yeah. I, you know, I was ambitious. I, I wanted to grow and I wanted yeah. to do things fast. And, you know, it, it came that's to the not, That's not corporate culture. <laughs> the corporate culture does not move fast. And so it, it, it's just like, like, then you have this option. It's highly risky. Uh, you have no idea what you're doing, but you know, it just, it, it kept gnawing at me saying, why aren't you doing this? Right. And so right, right. I, 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 I encourage people saying that, look, it, it becomes to your risk tolerance thresholds. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. um, because it's never going to be easy and right. you are going to get faced with a lot of rejection. And, you know, mm -hmm. I was not even prepared to hear, you know, all the things that were supposed to, uh, that's going to get uh, you know, thrown at me after I started, but you right. kind of were all in at that time. Like I didn't have a choice because I, I made the There's decision. There's no retreat. There's That's no retreat. retreat. Yeah. yeah. I, I do think that that is very important because I, I, I do think now looking back, you know, I, I always joke to every team member who joins Doc. I said that, look, when I recruited my co-founder, Leon, I said to him, oh, we're going to get funding in three months. You know, I, I got an investor lined up because that's what I, how naive I was. Right. My, the very first dollar came into Doc will, like 18 months later. Right. And right. so <laughs> you're not making money. There's no, so, right. um, I mean, it, it's hard, but now yeah. looking back, I really am thankful that I did not get that money within three months. Cause it, right. Uh, yeah. I would have hated myself. For in that. retro, in retro, it's funny how in retrospect, how many things that didn't swing your direction wind up being to your benefit. I, that is, a, that's a, like an interesting kind of, it absolutely is right we got uh, life <laughs> life dynamic if you will it you yep. know and I, i've had so many instances of that and to your point and i and i think this is an, i think it's important to talk to the other side of this right because there's a lot of information out there right now and a lot of stories that are getting told about really just egregious things and 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 it, it it's sad to think that we're still dealing with this you know at you know 60 you know 60 ish years after um you know, the civil rights movement, but it is reality. But, but to your point for, for any one situation that was like, wow, that's, that's, um, that's crazy that, that that's happening to me right now, you know, and, and we've all bumped into that one, you know, as people of color, if you're out there in the world, like we are. Um, but I, I swear for every one of those instances, there were 10 to 20 other instances of kindness and generosity and, and genuine just interest in seeing you seeing me win um, in whatever way that that always kind of gave me the fire to fight through that little BS and, and, um, mm -hmm. and, and not indict an entire cohort of people and bring that luggage to my next interaction. Um, because I think, you know, if you do that, eventually it will take you down, right? Yep. You have, you have to be able not to say you forget them and not to say that you don't, you know, stand your ground and command the respect you deserve as a person. But at the same time, you, you can't, you can't, you can't carry that with you into the next interaction because it, it's just, it's ultimately it'll, it'll take you down. And I, and I think that's an important thing to be said. Um, so I appreciate you touching on that. So, um, I mean, we're getting close to the end of our time. I, I did, and you kind of alluded to it, um, you know, just that retrospect and happy you didn't get the money. So like, if you were, if you were going to say the one, what's the one piece of advice that you would give yourself? And as an example, um, one of the things that I would tell myself and one of the things that I tell the kids um, when I do guest lecturing at my alma mater 
is that listen don't don't get caught up in the money you know it's really easy to get caught up in that early on and you may even do well right um from a monetary perspective um but if you're not intellectually stimulated by what it is that you're doing that it, it for me it's not a sustainable trajectory and you know what can happen is you'll wind up kind of jumping from one thing to the next because you're always looking for how you can make a few more bucks versus versus kind of thinking career progression and playing chess and, and these are building blocks and the next thing that I do needs to contribute to a bigger picture that I'm that I'm trying to create for myself. So those are the kind of things that I would tell my my uh, you know post college self if I could go back. Um, what what are one or two of the things that you would tell yourself you know, if you could go back to the beginning of this journey, you know, the money piece and glad that didn't come in. You said that, what, what else would you tell yourself? Well, that, I mean, definitely, I think the money piece is big, right? Because, uh, yeah. you know, when you're young, you know, on the early stages of a career, you're so financially motivated and for various mm -hmm. reasons, but you know, if you just invest in that progression of your career, you get to learn different things and then determine what the, you know, the chart of your career looks like. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. I'll tell you that, you know, it was a, you know, from a corporate job to a startup, I mean, especially in an early stage startup for many, many years, right? I mean, right. people talk about, you know, us right now in 2020, but, you know, we were there in 2014, 15, 16, 17, when we were an unknown quantity and not saying that we're a huge company right now, but still the struggle was way more real back then than it is mm -hmm. right now. And so right. it, it was the money that was the reason we're doing it. We, we would be stupid to have pursued that. <laughs> right, That's right. Um, and I think, true. Yeah, so I, I think it becomes to what you're talking about, the intellectual stimulation, the uh, potential for impact, uh, the potential for changing people's lives. I mean, you know, working with yep. people that you want to work with, right? Yep. I, mean, yep. I, I think those are all such huge uh, pieces to why you make a decision because it is one of the most hardest and frustrating things I've done yeah. in my life, but it's also one of the most fulfilling things I've ever done in my life, right? It's just a right. paradox. And so my advice would be is like, you know, find out, and I know it's sometimes cliche, but you know, you got to really use this time to discover what we really are good mm -hmm. at, really want to pursue mm -hmm. yeah. and, you know, get the, get the enough money that you can kind of go through your normal lifestyle, but not be in this rat race that I want to own an extra 15% more, 15% more. Right. Right. Never Pops. Right. And so that's one thing. And then the other thing I would say is just like, I, I don't think I was prepared for how hard the journey would be. And it, 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 right. it, you know, one would assume that, you know, if you had told me two years back that look at you, you would be 200% you know, of, you know, your current revenue and everything else and all this stuff. I'd be like, wow, sign me up for that. But you know, being in a position <laughs> right now, you know, I, you know, I still, it never got easy. Right. And right. Uh, the best way I can, kind of like, um, you know, correlate that piece is that I, I realized that there's like three steps to this journey is one is like when you're as a early founder, not even really a CEO, you're kind of like the jack of all trades. You're doing everything right. out there. Mm -hmm. Very different mentality at, at that point. And, you know, you got to then go to the next stage, which is now you're building a team and there's, you know, you have managers and then you have you know, raise some capital. And so that part has its own challenges. And then, you know, the stage where we're at, where, you know, our managers have managers who have managers. And so it's a different structure of the organization and different requirements and different kind of people who walk into the dark pool. And so yeah. if you're not able to adapt to each one of these steps. And if you still act like uh, the entrepreneur, founder, CEO, the jack of all trades in phase three, it's, you know, it's, it can get very hard because you might yep. be micromanaging people and you might be yep. in your bottleneck. Yeah. So the CEO, you got to start adapting with this journey or else, you know, you get left behind. Yeah. You know, it's funny. You, you mentioned, um, you mentioned that kind of where there's this point where if you're involved in everything, um, you, you, you do, you start to actually push people away that, that, um, that you ultimately don't want to, it's not an intentional thing. Um, John Walk Maxwell gets into that uh, 21 irrefutable, irrefutable laws of leadership, I believe. And um, there's a chapter in there, I think it calls the law of the lid. Um, and it kind of gets to that thing. There's a point where you actually become the lid on the organization because you cannot, I'm paraphrasing, but basically you, you, there's a point where the organization needs to start growing away from you. 
And if you're, and if you're feeling like you have to be involved in everything, it won't happen. And if you don't get that replication, you know, happening, you're, you're actually working against yourself. And, um, and it's and, hard and, too because as a, you know, you, you, as someone who kind of grew with every single decision going through, I mean, I'm sure if some of my team members are listening to this, they'll probably like, yeah, but sometimes he still wants me to make that decision. And it's because it's hard because it innate to you, but yeah. you know, but I'm, I'm really like uh, proud because sometimes, you know, we'll get product release notes and I find out that something new was released inside our product having read a product release notes. And I'm like, okay, great. I mean, it's like, I, right. It's, it's happening. happening. <laughs> right. Someone who and I think for a product, something changed and I was even aware of it until I read the release notes. Right. And I think, you know, once again, it's like you, you those are the things you want to happen. And, and, and you, you, it's so easy to, to get in the way of, of those amazing yeah. things. I think you hire the right people, right? You give them a goal. You, you recognize that not every decision they make is going to work out to plan. And, you know, you just create a, a system of accountability that people know, listen, I can go out there, I can put my neck out, I can win on some occasions, I can fail on others, but ultimately I know I'm going to be treated the same way regardless and respected. And I think those are the things that create a really healthy environment where people feel compelled to take risks and speak up and, 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 that, and, and have that healthy conflict and all those things that really contribute to a great culture and working environment, ultimately the things that really lead people to buy into the vision and, and take, take, take a purse, take personal ownership in the mission of the organization. Um, and, and I think that's where, that's where the magic happens. It's not, and that's, and, and, and to tie this off, is a lot of times people get caught up in the quant in the spreadsheets and the conversion rates and like, like all the little things that are, you know, that tell you how the business is doing and they forget that ultimately all these outcomes are driven by human behavior and that you have to pick your head up and, and, and be as qualitative as you are quantitative and maybe even more so. And I think that's an uncomfortable space for a lot of people and they, they tend to go back to what's comfortable for them. Right. So um, a bit soapboxy, but I, I think super relevant. And um, and I, I'll I'll say this: uh, I, I couldn't be happier that you that you figured it all out, man. It's it's been a, it's been great working with I you. Think I figured last. it all out, but I'm I'm a journey to yeah yeah. You're, but yeah, I mean, but you know, you're winning, and I and I couldn't be happier for you. And and I know that the the relationship won't last forever. It's not the nature of how lighter capital works with with companies. But I'm always so appreciative of, you know, the years that I do get to spend with people. And then when I see them go off to that next thing where it's a VC raise or they exit, you know, whatever that goal was, it always makes me feel good that I had a little peace in that, right? And, um, yeah. and so I'm, and thank, I'm hopeful. Thankful to you, Jody, and thankful yeah. to Lighter. I mean, look, look, obviously, you know, when, when we need capital and, you know, you and I, you know, we were evaluating other, uh, you know, potential comparators yeah. and, you know, it was, it, you, you can, and we talk about negotiation, but I'll tell you, most of it is also the relationship and the relationship mm -hmm. that you and I built before we even signed the dotted lines. And I think that was a big part of the reason why you know, we chose Lighter. And you know, Lighter has been part of our journey. And you know, we started small, and you know, we negotiated again last year, and yeah. we got it before, right. So I think that's why you know Lighter has been a big part of our uh, our growth strategy here too. And so you know, to the folks who are listening or curious about Lighter, I mean, I'm happy to have a conversation on a one-on-one basis with them to interested. That's awesome, man. I'm a beautiful. I can't think of a better, a better way to tie it off. Uh, G, have a wonderful weekend. All Cheers. the success Cheers. in the world, brother. I appreciate Thank you. you. Thank you so much. All folks. Right. Bye -bye. All right. Bye.